uh, I thought I might spend a minute or two in introducing the panel on uh, a point of, I don't think it's exactly personal privilege, but it's a, a point about, about me. Um, <laughs> I've had a kind of uh, David Lodge style trading places week. Uh, starting last week, I went to a conference uh, of lawyers, social scientists, and activists on abortion rights. Then in the middle of the week, I flew east to go to a uh, discussion among lawyers, social scientists, and activists on civil rights and racial justice issues. And now I find myself at the end of that period uh, back here at a conference on marriage equality and LGBT issues. And of course, when you think about these issues and the Supreme Court, which is going to be uh, a lot of the focus of this panel, you can't help but notice that these different movements and these different arguments have been cutting in very different directions uh, over the past uh, three generations. So, you know, Jane kicked us off yesterday morning talking about the three decades uh, of uh, marriage litigation and how the trajectory has moved there. And of course, over that period of time, I think it's fair to say the three generations of civil rights litigation and racial justice issues have cut in exactly the opposite way. The Supreme Court has become increasingly restrictive and increasingly skeptical of uh, arguments about racial equality. And one of the things that really struck me, and I was talking to Marianne Case before the panel about this, uh, that um, makes a real, uh, that I found most striking is in the same week that the Windsor case and the Perry case came down on Wednesday, uh, on Tuesday, the Supreme Court struck down uh, major portions of the Voting Rights Act of 1965, and in doing that, used the same language about equality and dignity uh, that was used uh, the day later in Windsor, only this time the court was talking about the equality of the states uh, and the dignity of the states as a reason to strike down a statute uh, in the same way that the court used the equality of individuals and the dignity of individuals as uh, a reason to strike down a major piece of federal social legislation the next day. And so I hope in the time that we have for discussion, like we might think about how constitutional law is being thought of across a, a wide variety of domains. Uh, the format for today's presentation is we have four pr presenters. And since we're talking about the Supreme Court a lot in our discussion and about courts, uh, I'm going to do something that happens a lot when you talk about these issues in courts, which is I'm going to hold people to a rigid time limit, and I'm going to cut them off in mid-sentence, if need be, at, mom at, at minute 15. Um, there are three kinds of introductions that I really hate when I'm on panels. The first is the introduction that says something like, uh, Bill Eskridge needs no introduction, <laughs> but then gives you one anyway, just to show that need is not everything. Uh, the second kind of introduction is the read the program introduction, in which I pick up the program and I read to you, lest you be uh, illiterate in English or visually impaired, everything that the program says about uh, Tom Berg. And the third kind of introduction that I hate is what I call the just met you on Google. Uh, in, uh, in, uh, uh, introduction in which I pick random facts off of the Wikipedia page about you and hope that I get it right. I don't know how many of you have seen recently the discussion of the Six Wives of Henry VIII in which Jane Seymour, the actress, rather than Jane Seymour, the, uh, the, widow, the, the, the died in childbirth third wife, is the picture in the middle of the group. And, you know, uh, there's something really weird about Anne of Cleves by, you know, uh, Hans Holbein and Jane Seymour by Richard Avedon sitting right next to each other. Um, so I'm not going to do any, kind, any of those kinds of introductions. Instead, I'm just going to say that you are in for um, what uh, Robert Bork referred to as an intellectual feast <laughs> today. Um, you're going to hear, <laughs> it didn't do him much good in his <laughs> um, So the four people who are going to talk to you today are four people whose work, at least for me, causes me to see familiar arguments and familiar issues in different ways. Each of them does what I think of as uh, doctrinal and legal origami, in which they take the paper on which uh, opinions have been written, and they fold it in interesting ways that make you see that it's really a bird, or you know, or a rabbit, or something like that. Um, no, I mean seriously, there are artists in the law. 
so let me tell you the order in which they're going to speak in the titles of, of the papers, and then I will leave it to them. There'll be uh, a little bit of time for us to discuss among ourselves after the presentations, reactions, and comments across them. Uh, and then there'll be time for you all to join the conversation as well. Uh, so the first person who's going to speak is Kenji Yoshino from NYU. Uh, his paper is entitled, As a Matter of Fact, The Establishment of and Review of Legislative Facts in Hollingsworth Against Perry. Uh, I guess he's taking off from Ronald Reagan's point that facts are stupid things. Um, then we're going to have Marianne Case from the University of Chicago Law School, and she's going to talk about dignities. Then we're going to have Tom Berg from the University of St. Thomas School of Law, and he's going to be talking about protecting same-sex marriage and religious liberty uh, after Windsor. And then we're going to have Bill Eskridge from Yale uh, batting cleanup, uh, and he's going to talk about marriage equality, constitutionalism, originalism, and dynamic religious doctrine. So with that, uh, I will turn it over to Kenji. Great. Thank you so much, Pam, and thank you so much, Jane, and thank you so much, Gary, for your warm hospitality. This has been a, a great conference. I'm going to be speaking today, as Pam said, about the establishment of facts and what counts as a fact in Supreme Court litigation. And I'm going to begin by reflecting on Sir William Blackstone, the great uh, author of the Commentaries of the Laws of England, who wrote in the 1760s that for every case that turned on an issue of law, there were over a hundred that turned on an issue of fact. <laughs> And so what he was trying to get at is that although lawyers think of themselves as sparring over fine points of law, more often than not, cases get disposed of as a matter of fact. And nowhere, I think, is this more evident than in the district court opinion in Perry versus Schwarzenegger, where there was voluminous fact-finding taken by uh, District Judge Von Walker. So what Von Walker did was he set for trial issues that we ordinarily wouldn't think of as necessarily being susceptible to adjudicative fact-finding. So for example, with respect to the right to marry, he said, what is the nature of this institution? What is the nature of this right? With respect to the Equal Protection Clause inquiry, he said, what are the merits with respect to the four heightened scrutiny factors? Are gays historically discriminated against? Uh, are gays politically powerless today? Are gays marked by an obvious, immutable, or distinguishing characteristic? And do gays have an equal capacity to contribute to society? Then he turned to the reasons, and he said, what reasons might the state have for opposing uh, marriage equality? And he said, well, the state might have reasons relating to uh, the optimal child-rearing environment for kids, or it might have objections with respect to the deleterious effects that same-sex marriage would have an opposite-sex marriage. So there's a 12-day trial you know, uh, spanning around 3,000 pages of trial transcript. And there are 17 witnesses on one side. Uh, the plaintiffs produced nine experts, including Professor Segura, and eight lay witnesses. And the proponents produced two. Right? So in this 136-page opinion that results from this trial, there are 80 findings of fact. And as a preparatory note to these facts, the judge says that the presentation of the plaintiffs dwarfed that of the uh, proponents. And so this leaves the question open as to what this was, and there are various explanations. But I want to focus on one. One explanation that the proponents gave was that the kinds of facts that Judge Walker sought to ascertain were not the kinds of facts that were properly submitted to the trial process because they were legislative facts as opposed to adjudicative facts. This distinction comes from the work of an administrative law scholar, Kenneth Culp Davis, in an article that he wrote in 1942. He defines adjudicative facts as facts that are specific to a particular dispute, the when, where, why, where, and how, a particular kind of journalistic facts of a particular uh, adjudicative uh, dispute. Whereas he says that legislative facts are broad sociological facts that actually span disputes. I think that this is probably best sharpened up by example. So if we think about adjudicative facts, the question about whether or not a signature was forged or real on a will would be an adjudicative fact. Whereas the question as to whether or not modern technology had evolved to such an extent that such forgeries were uh, very difficult to detect would be a legislative fact. Turning to the case at hand, 
the question as to whether or not Paul Katami and Jeff Zerillo actually filed for and were denied a marriage license would be an adjudicative fact. Whereas the question as to whether or not uh, same-sex marriage would have negative consequences on opposite-sex marriages would be a legislative fact. And what Davis says is that generally we submit adjudicative facts to the adversarial fact-finding processes of a trial, and generally we do not submit legislative facts uh, to such processes. And so what the lead counsel for the plaintiffs argued throughout the trial, beginning with the pretrial hearing for a preliminary injunction all the way through to the Supreme Court, was that legislative facts are not properly submitted to the adversarial fact-finding processes of the trial court, and so therefore these 80 factual findings that were rendered by the court shouldn't have occurred in the first place and were due no deference thereafter. And what I want to do in the balance of this talk is to ask some questions about that uh, argument, which is to say that I'm going to try and take the position, or at least explore the position, that there are very good reasons to submit legislative facts to uh, trial processes, and that we only need a very few small tweaks in the appellate level with respect to the kinds of levels of deference that we give to that kind of fact-finding in order to have a coherent legal system uh, with respect to these facts. So I don't see that much of a distinction, the shorthand would be, between the fact-finding with respect to legislative facts and with respect to adjudicative facts. Okay. So let's begin. The first objection to submitting legislative facts to the trial process is really efficiency. And Kenneth Culp Davis himself says, in most instances, it would be inefficient to submit legislative facts to the trial process because adjudicators have to rely on so many different kinds of facts that are not indisputable. So judicial notice can't be taken of these facts. And so if litigants were permitted to say, well, I want to submit each one of these to the trial process, then we would never get to a decision. And against that, I want to say that Kenneth Culp Davis actually goes on to say, however, in instances where uh, we believe that a particular issue would be illuminated by an evidentiary hearing, even with respect to a legislative fact, a hearing should be had. So he cites with approval a case in which trade practices are at issue, and the Supreme Court says, uh, we are trying to interpret a particular regulation, but we can't interpret the lawfulness of the regulation without the background facts of the trade practices that are in play within the milk industry, and so we're going to kick this down to the district court for fact-finding on the issue. So there's a remand on legislative facts that meets with Kenneth Culp Davis's full approval. Similarly, at trial, uh, because there isn't clear Supreme Court authority on this issue, uh, Chuck Cooper, uh, for Cooper and Kirk, who represented the proponents, cites a Dick Posner opinion from the Seventh Circuit, the Indiana Harbor Belt Railroad case, where he says that Dick Posner says adjudicative facts go to trial and legislative facts don't. But if you continue reading on in the Dick Posner opinion, Dick Posner goes on to say this line should not be regarded as hard and fast, and where an evidentiary hearing would help, it can be and should be held. Right? So I want to say that we are oftentimes in danger of conflating this point that legislative facts need not be subjected to trial with the point that legislative facts must not be subjected to trial. Right? And I want to open up the space to say that there are certain occasions when it's very useful to have these legislative facts submitted to trial. So that leaves me with a $64,000 question of how do I winnow out the legislative facts that we would submit to trial from the legislative facts that we would not. Right? And I only have the beginnings of an answer to that today. But I would say that, at a minimum, we should submit them when we have repeated calls by appellate courts to submit such facts to trial. So if we think about this, uh, what we have is, in the case at hand, an intermediate state appellate court refusing to give heightened scrutiny to gays in the in re marriage cases, in part because it says the trial court below refused to engage in a trial to establish the predicates of heightened scrutiny. Right. So Von Walker, faced with this, right, is confronting an opinion that says our dissenting colleague wants to give heightened scrutiny to sexual orientation on the basis of law review articles. This we declined to do. So obviously, if you are a smart district judge, especially a smart district judge who knows that you may be confronting charges of bias in the future, you're going to be ordering a trial on these issues in order to protect yourself uh, from future criticism that you didn't engage in the diligence that was necessary to a potential finding of heightened scrutiny on the basis of sexual orientation. 
So I think that the efficiency concern can be set aside, at least as a categorical block on setting legislative facts for trial. The second consideration of three is really the institutional competence concern. And I think that this is really the main issue. And Justice Alito very articulately uh, spoke on this issue in his dissent in the United States versus Windsor case, where joined by Justice Clarence Thomas, he said really two things. The first thing that he said is, look, you know, the court does not need to speak to this issue because the law does not speak to this issue. So he says that there are two visions of marriage on the table. One is the conjugal vision of marriage that says that marriage is between a man and a woman because that union is ordered to procreation, whether or not procreation occurs therein. The other one is a consent-based view of marriage in which what's an issue is the consent of two adults uh, to marry each other, and therefore, uh, obviously, same-sex couples would be able to marry under the first vision, but not under, under the second vision, but not under the first. What Alito says is that the Constitution is silent with respect to this issue. And given that the Constitution is silent, we should uh, basically leave this to the political processes. And this question of what a marriage is is much better answered, he says, by philosophers, by historians, and by theologians <laughs> right, rather than by judges. And so it's really a claim that is about the law doesn't speak to this. And once the law doesn't speak to this, it's much better remitted uh, to the political process. But hidden within that political process, uh, or that political process is populated by these wise uh, experts in, in various fields. Now, I think my disagreement with uh, Justice Alito begins with this point about whether or not the Constitution is silent and the fact that there isn't a legal issue here. right? Because after all, what we're talking about is the legal right. Everyone agrees that there is a fundamental right to marry. The proponents say that the plaintiffs are asking for the new right of same-sex marriage. And the plaintiffs are responding that they are not seeking a new right. They're simply a new group seeking access to an old right. And so what they say is, you know, we are a new group that is seeking the same right to marry as everybody else. And we are no more asking for the right to same-sex marriage than interracial couples in Loving versus Virginia were asking for the right to interracial marriage. Or inmates in Turner versus Safley were asking for the right to inmate marriage. You know, all these groups are new groups that were asking to be uh, enfolded within the rubric of the right to marry. And of course, in order to determine whether or not that right extends to those groups or not, we have to have a definition of that right. And as is so often the case in due process analysis, the answer relies on the level of abstraction that the court chooses. And that level of abstraction, in turn, can be informed by things like the testimony of Nancy Cott, who tells a history, including a legal history of marriage, that talks about the fact that we might be able to advert to a higher rather than a lower level of generality in this issue. So I think that that's just a pure disagreement with Justice Alito. But I think that once we ascertain that this question has to be answered, the question then becomes, does the fact that the judiciary uh, feels uncomfortable or incompetent to answer this in any deep way, you know, should that block us from setting those issues for trial? Right? And my answer is absolutely not. Right? Uh, because if the judiciary has to answer this question, the issue isn't really one of institutional competence. The institution has to answer the question. The issue is really one of how institutionally incompetent the particular institution is going to reveal itself to be in that context. And I think that the judiciary can get a lot of help uh, from the trial processes in ascertaining what the meets and bounds of this right could be from the very historians, theologians, or uh, philosophers uh, that Justice Alito uh, putatively uh, says are more uh, likely to be found in the political process. As a sidebar to this, I think that there is also a very utopian vision of what the political process looks like when determining legal rights. Right, so I'm reminded here of uh, Douglas Laycock's great send-up of the legislative process, where he says, we romanticize uh, le the legislative uh, fact-finding mechanism, but let's look at uh, what happens in the legislative process. He says, legislators can engage in true investigations, but they rarely do. And if we look at congressional uh, fact-finding and congressional hearings, what we see is four people on a panel who are given five minutes each 
uh, committee chairs who sort of uh, say, you know, don't be offended if people wander in and out uh, while uh, we have this hearing, and a limited amount of time with prepared remarks and no cross-examination. So compare that to uh, what poor Professor Segura was subjected to during the trial, which is a day and a half of cross-examination on his views, and tell me that you think that we got to a better answer in the legislative process uh, than we got to in the Prop 8 trial with respect to the question of whether gays and lesbians are politically powerless. With respect to the third issue, uh, I see you have two minutes left, so let me uh, wrap this up. With respect to the third issue, the final issue is one about administrability and whether or not uh, individuals can actually, uh, uh, or whether or not actually appellate courts can give their appropriate level of deference to lower courts. And here what I want to say is uh, that the standard of review is generally one of clear error for issues of fact. And I think that that has really confused issues greatly. Because as the evidence scholar McCormick has said, if on a close question two courts come to exactly opposing views uh, within the same circuit, what's an appellate court to do? Because neither is clearly erroneous. One has said X, one has, not, has said not X. So you just cannot give clear error deference uh, to both lower courts. I think the easy fix here, as argued in the miller chemerinsky brief in the Supreme Court in Hollingsworth versus Perry, was to substitute a significant weight standard for that. And so you can just tweak the level of uh, deference that's uh, due by the appellate court. So I didn't realize quite how little time uh, I had left, so I'm actually going to drive this to a close. And so my basic point here is that these three objections, uh, efficiency, competence, and administrability, don't cut against a uh, finding uh, a, a push towards uh, legislative facts on the part of uh, trial courts, and that this could actually ramify in other contexts, like you know whether or not women tend to regret their abortions, Gonzalez versus Carhartt, where, whether money corrupts uh, elections, and Citizens United. And you know the the general point that I want to come back to, and I'm being told to stop now, so I will, uh, but but I won't. Uh, so but he will. But he will. <laughs> but I will. But he will. Uh, uh, the one last line, Pam, before you yank me off the stage. Because I can't resist giving you this quote from Wigmore, right, where he says that cross-examination is the greatest legal device ever invented for the discovery of truth. He's come under a lot of criticism, right, and having thought about it, uh, I don't think that he is wrong. And as a matter of fact, we could say, I think he may be right. Thank you. <laughs> grateful to Pam and Jane for inviting me to do this um, because it has energized me to think about things, putting together uh, actually stuff I've been thinking about for 20 years, but putting it together newly for the first time. So this origami process Pam was talking about, I'm quite literally standing here with the papers. Uh, we don't know what the shape is going to be. I should also tell you that this is literally the first presentation in my entire life I'm doing with glasses. So <laughs> it makes you look so much more academic and distinguished. <laughs> looks so deceiving. <laughs> um, so here's the thing. Uh, I'm going to talk to you about um, dignities in the plural. Uh, and um, I've titled this dignities because uh, there are, first of all, two major different kinds of dignities uh, I want to talk about. Those dignities you simply have, for example, by virtue of being human, and those that you are given, for example, uh, by the state, those associated with a particular rank and status. The second kind of dignity is in itself plural, and there will be more about this later. That's going to be the general theme of my remarks, and this is going to be a good news, bad news presentation from whatever perspective you are, if you're a gay rights advocate, if you're a religious liberties advocate, if you're a, a proponent of alternatives to marriage. Uh, there are some, uh, well, actually, your proponent of alternatives to marriage is only bad news. Uh, <laughs> but so, um, and it's going to start with a close reading of the text of Windsor. I mean, at the, uh, when Lawrence came out, I wrote a piece for the Supreme Court Review called uh, Of This and That in Lawrence Against Texas, which 
was, among other things, literally about the words this and that. And my Catholic grade school sentence diagramming came into play, and my undergraduate training as a literary critic, uh, because I started reading the text of Lawrence, and there were these sentences with these unclear reference, right? This demonstrates, and you don't know whether this is the previous sentence or the whole of the opinion to this point. Um, and there's no way of really telling. Um, so I looked at this other Kennedy opinion and started reading, and what looked out at me was the use of the word dignity, not only its frequency, but it seemed to me that the word dignity was being used in a very different and bad news for gay people way, uh, and, and for same-sex marriage, than the word dignity as uh, the European uh, courts that Kennedy is so fond of use it, that the Vatican, uh, who influences Kennedy's use, uh, uh, use it. Uh, it's not Kantian human dignity um, or uh, religious human dignity. It's, it's dignity uh, in the plural. It's, again, something the state gives us. Let me read you a few sample uh, quotations. Um, uh, the state decision to give this class of persons the right to marry conferred upon them a dignity and status of immense import. Um, Text demonstrates that interference with the equal dignity of same-sex marriage is conferred by the states in the exercise of their sovereign power. Uh, it seems fair to conclude that until recent years, many citizens have not even considered the possibility that two persons of the same sex might aspire to occupy the same status and dignity as that of a man and woman uh, in lawful uh, marriage. Uh, for others came the beginning of a new perspective. Accordingly, some states concluded that same-sex marriage ought to be given recognition uh, and validity uh, in law. Uh, dot, dot, dot. The state's power in defining the marital relationship is of central relevance in this case, quite apart from principles of federalism. Here, the state's decision to give this class of persons the right to marry conferred upon them a dignity and status of immense import. Um, when the state used its historic and essential authority to define the marital relation in this way, its role and its power in making the decision enhanced the recognition, dignity, and protection of the class in their own community. Okay, I could, I could go on, but every single one of the references to dignity in Windsor are to this dignity that the states in their discretion confer. Uh, compare, for example, so I, when, when I, dignity also comes up in Lawrence. Uh, and in Lawrence, um, and when I did the piece on, dig, uh, on the words in Lawrence, I looked at what Kennedy had used dignity before. Two groups of people had dignity before in Kennedy opinions. States, and here I turn to Pam and what she said in her introductory remarks, and prisoners. Uh, and you'll note that what uh, Kennedy says in uh, Lawrence about uh, the dignity uh, of the actors, uh, he says, um, it suffices for us to acknowledge that adults may choose to enter upon this relationship in the confines of their homes and their own private lives and still retain their dignity as free persons. That is to say, not prisoners. And free persons is a status, like prisoner is a status, like husband is a status, like wife is a status. Blackstone, Kenji started with the domestic relations, husband and wife, um, master and slave, uh, you know, in the last millennium, uh, I said that the real question for migratory same-sex marriages was part of that holding of Dred Scott that had not been overruled, which is whether you took your status relationship from place to place. Dred Scott said you did. You remained a slave. Just now you remain a husband. Do you then similarly remain a husband or a wife? If, so I will go on to talk about one of the things this does is, uh, is re reinforce the, the notion that marriage is a status relationship. Right? Not a, it's a civil status relationship. It's hugely important that it's a civil status relationship. So one of the things this is bad news for is the people who want to argue that marriage is a pre-political institution, that marriage is a natural kind, that marriage is something that the religious defines. All of this stuff I've read to you about dignity reinforces the notion that marriage is civil, but it's also bad news for people like me who say that it's a civil contract. It focuses on the fact that it is a civil status. Um, and it's status in both senses of the word. It's also status in the sense of being one up. And that's um, good news for the people um, who value marriage, whether in the uh, gay community uh, or, you know, every time I debate Maggie Gallagher, one of the things I say to her is, if you and people like you are serious in saying that what you care about is marriage and a marriage culture and not keeping gay people down, 
you ought to be kissing the feet of gay people because no one, nothing has energized marriage more as the gold standard for relationships than the same-sex marriage movement. And uh, I'm one of these people who, I mean, at the, I'm at the University of Chicago. Um, I talk about theories of the firm and the family. I want there to be a menu of options. I've, I've spent, before I got to Chicago at Virginia, I was writing about analogies between marriage and the corporation. And what I said is that the long history of marriage and the corporation from 18th century England to, to the present uh, was you started out with, some, with uh, a status conferred on the favorites of the state for enumerated worthy purposes, uh, the West India Company uh, or the husband and wife, over time became uh, applicable to almost anyone for almost any purpose uh, that didn't even have to be specified. And uh, corporations, like my now colleagues Easterbrook and Michelle said, became a network of contract. Outsiders could recognize that you were a corporation, uh, but insiders uh, could negotiate among themselves, similarly with respect to marriage, almost anyone for almost any purpose, and that marriage offered much more freedom than, uh, than domestic partnerships. But that uh, just like we don't care whether you are, by and large, a corporation or a partnership, we don't care whether you are um, you know, married or in a domestic partnership or um, you know, uh, go into the private market for your sexual and reproductive uh, services. Uh, so long as for your sexual services, that market is not commercial. Uh, in any event, so there's this notion of status being one up. Um, and this also ties into the notion that it's civil, right? So I, I heard the words of the Book of Common Prayer in this. Marriage, which is an honorable estate, ordained by God, is what the Book of Common Prayer says. But what this opinion says is ordained by the state in the exercise of its sovereign power. Now we come back to federalism. You know, when the guy says, uh, when they say it's not about the money, it's about the money. When Kennedy says it's not about federalism, it's about federalism. Um, so I have, uh, you know, before the Windsor opinion, I was uh, working with a draft that I hope now to extend to, um, you know, marijuana and obscenity and guns uh, now in same-sex marriage. Uh, that talks about uh, what it means for federalism to protect the freedom of the individual, which is another quote from a Kennedy uh, opinion. Um, and it's the hybrid vigor of the individual uh, supported by um, uh, a state. So this gives new uh, energy to uh, Brandeis's notion of the states as laboratories of, uh, for experimentation, but it also calls into play the, the, the prohibition on titles of nobility, right? Uh, this is a title of nobility that uh, the state is uh, conveying in allowing some people to marry. And I, those of you who remember uh, the um, Vermont Supreme Court opinion, uh, it riffed off the Common Benefits Clause in the Vermont Constitution and said, why do we have to include uh, same-sex couples uh, in something like marriage? Uh, it's because it, it was the equivalent of the No Titles of Nobility Clause. It said society uh, is uh, created for the common benefit of all, not for the benefit uh, of only a few. But there is the sense, uh, for me as a marriage resistor, uh, that marriage is not, that the title of nobility of marriage conferred by the individual states in the exercise of their sovereign power uh, is now being uh, validated, uh, is now being uh, authorized uh, and, uh, and encouraged. Um, so this is bad for the single, uh, bad for uh, alternatives uh, to marriage. Um, and it, it strikes me as that this is something I, I teach a course on marriage, and one of, I haven't found a better word for this than oomph, but so please help me uh, with this. Uh, marriage you know, in the post-same-sex marriage movement, one of the few things we look to the state for our oomph for, right? And the only other thing I can think of is uh, citizenship ceremonies, right? Where, and it's so, you know, both the same-sex marriage um, proponents and uh, seculars uh, resisted the notion that marriage should be abolished rather than <coughs> extended to same-sex couples, that either the state should not have uh, an institution at all or it should be called civil unions. The state not having an institution at all, uh, I argue in my analogy between marriage and the corporation, would be, here again I show I belong at the University of Chicago, inefficient. Um, but that notion of marriage is also one that has uh, fallen out. So the, my favorite opinion of all the same-sex marriage opinions is um, 
of uh, Justice Denise Johnson. You heard me uh, praise her yesterday because she said that uh, denying same-sex couples marriage is sex discrimination uh, and they should get it immediately. But I also like her for her non-romantic, non-status-based, non-one-up non notion of marriage. Uh, she says in Baker versus Vermont, this case concerns the secular licensing of marriage. The state's interest in licensing marriage is regulatory in nature. Uh, in granting a marriage license, the state is not espousing certain morals, lifestyles, or relationships, but only identifying those persons entitled to the benefits of the marital status. Now, just as Justice Johnson was um, dissenting on the sex discrimination issue um, and lost, um, this is another issue on which I would argue she has lost. It is now, once again, and I'm sad to say, uh, about uh, espousing certain morals, lifestyles, uh, and, uh, and relationships. Now, I think we can get from here to there um, in the sense that uh, what is not, you know, the human dignity, which is not what is being discussed here, um, will eventually, I think, I mean, so the people who are reading Windsor as being already about human dignity of gay people uh, may evolve into being right as Kennedy evolves into using this language uh, for, uh, for, for same-sex couples, for uh, gay people in particular. But again, I want to heighten the contrast uh, between what he says in Lawrence, retain their dignity as free persons, and uh, what he says in, um, for example, Carhart, where he says that the purpose of the act is that the act, quote, expresses respect for the dignity of human life. Um, and uh, the Casey court described the centrality of the decision whether to bear or beget a, a, a child essential to a woman's dignity and autonomy, her personhood and destiny. These are not dignities that the state gives you in the exercise of your sovereign power. Um, now, I've gotten much farther along than I thought I would in the time I had. How you much have time have I got? Three minutes. That's why I hadn't put out the two minutes sign. Ah, <laughs> yes. OK. So this kind of dignity, you know, if you're looking at other places where Kennedy talks, or, you know, the Stolen Valor Act, right? Maintaining the dignity of the government service. It's that kind of, uh, you know, almost medieval throwback dignity. There's a, one of the other sub-themes of, uh, of the current Supreme Court is the medieval throwback, Hosanna Tabor, um, and the corporatism of the Roberts Court uh, also have these uh, medieval flavors. And I want to finish then uh, with how we got from uh, medieval notions of dignity to human dignity. Um, in, um, in from, yeah, I, one of my other projects is to work on the Vatican and gender. And uh, that's, you know, the human dignity would be destroyed if, um, if the nature of the human being as male and female were eliminated, says Ratzinger. He thinks people like me uh, can single, you know, people like the people in this room can, can destroy human nature uh, because we will uh, take sex and gender out of the law. He gives the law that power. He gives feminists and gay rights activists that power. Pico de Miranda, uh, who talked about human dignity, was talking about a particular human dignity of a particular kind of dignity, that is to say human, uh, because he was distinguishing human beings from the angels uh, and from uh, the beasts. And what he said was unique about humans uh, was their ability uh, to change, to move up, down, uh, and sideways. And it's that notion that I would like to have retained. And I worry that uh, when we're back to status, both in the sense of being rigid and in the sense of being one up, we're taking a giant step backward. That's that. Good morning. Uh, I too want to thank uh, Jane and uh, Gary for inviting me and uh, putting on such a uh, really interesting and worthwhile conference, uh, including the session last night. Uh, so I'm going to talk about religious liberty and same-sex marriage. As more states recognize same-sex marriage and potentially courts require it on constitutional grounds, the key issues will increasingly concern religious liberty claims of organizations and believers who object to directly facilitating uh, such marriages 
uh, through acts such as counseling, uh, adoption placements, or providing various kinds of services for a ceremony. Now, I approach this question uh, not as a gay rights scholar, it's a religious liberty scholar and advocate. So I'm a, a, a bit of a marginal person in the room in terms of subject matter here. Uh, but I also um, approach it as someone who supports same-sex marriage as both fair, wise policy and a constitutional right. So with Doug Laycock um, uh, at uh, Virginia, I filed a, a brief on behalf of the American Jewish Congress uh, supporting the plaintiffs in Windsor and Perry and arguing that the court uh, should also explicitly emphasize in what would be probably gross dicta, but, uh, but nevertheless do it, uh, the need to protect religious liberty broadly in the aftermath of same-sex marriage recognition. Uh, because the, 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 the sort of catalyst for this was that some of the arguments uh, made uh, against same-sex marriage, including the court, uh, in particular brief by the Beckett Fund, uh, were religious liberty arguments providing a reason to, uh, to deny marriage. Uh, our point was that it's possible to protect both, and that is, in fact, what ought to happen. I think it's fair to say that our position is somewhat unusual. In fact, it may be, as you listen to me, you'll find it, uh, you in this room will find it unusual. Uh, you may disagree with many aspects of it or all of it, but I hope I'll at least be able to make the case that there's a serious issue here. So part of my remarks on this are drawn from the brief we filed. First, let me, what time did I, uh, did I start at? Uh, you started at, so I can look well, up. my watch, I always do fast, so I won't be like, but it doesn't move fast within the minutes. I mean, each minute. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, that would really be at mean. this point, you have... You have um, 13 minutes left. Okay. Good. So does that help? That helps, yes. Okay. And 26. Okay, good. I'll have a look at the clock before I start. All right. Let me first make the case for protecting religious liberty strongly along with same-sex marriage. Same-sex civil marriage is a great advance for human liberty. But failure to attend to the religious liberty implications could create a whole new set of problems for the liberties of those religious organizations and believers who can't conscientiously recognize or facilitate such marriages. The victory for human liberty will be severely compromised if the state now acts to oppress religious dissenters, just as those dissenters, when they had the power to do so, pushed the state to oppress same-sex couples. I argue that uh, sexual minorities and religious minorities make essentially parallel claims on the larger society. And the strongest features of the case for same-sex civil marriage also make a strong case for protecting the religious liberty of dissenters. Well, first point on that is that both same-sex couples and committed religious believers argue that some aspects of human identity are so fundamental that they should be left to each individual, uh, free from all non-essential state regulation, uh, even when manifested in conduct. For same-sex couples, the conduct at issue is to join personal commitment and sexual expression in a multifaceted, intimate relationship with the person they love. For religious believers, the conduct at issue is to live and act consistently with the demands made by the being who created us all and holds the whole world together. In finding rights to same-sex civil marriage, Courts have understandably ruled that sexual orientation should be protected from burdens and discriminations, even if it's not strictly immutable. Uh, it's so integral an aspect of identity, the courts say, that a person should not be required to repudiate it in order to avoid discriminatory or severe burdens. But the same is true for religious beliefs, which is a chief reason why our federal and state constitutional, uh, constitutions protect the free exercise of religion. For serious believers, religious commitment influences virtually every area of life, from family relations to raising children, from friendships to ethical norms in careers, and uh, where and how to serve others. As uh, Alan Brownstein at the University of California Davis writes, almost any other individual decision pales in comparison to the serious commitment to religious faith. The courts have also recognized, uh, I'm sorry, rejected a distinction between sexual orientation and sexual conduct, 
because uh, I think they've correctly found uh, the, uh, or, both the orientation and the conduct proceeding from it are central to a person's identity. To separate the two uh, effectively prescribes celibacy for the entire group, which is something far too burdensome for the state to demand. But religious believers also face attempts to dismiss their claims as involving mere conduct outside the scope of the constitutional right and subject to any and all state regulation. That is pretty much the approach that the Supreme Court adopted for the Free Exercise Clause in Employment Division versus Smith, the Sacramental Peyote case, where it held that the clause does not protect against burdens imposed by a general law regulating conduct. Now, a brief summary of free exercise law. I've already done part of it here. That's the federal constitutional rule, Smith. But about 30 states have rejected the Smith rule, and so has the federal government by statute. In states, it's either by religious freedom statutes or by constitutional rule. And they require the government to show a compelling reason for imposing significant or substantial burdens on religiously motivated conduct. I think those states are basically correct. Believers feel compelled to act in accordance with God's will, and the state should not demand that they, uh, they contravene that without very good reasons any more than it should demand celibacy or other burdens of gays and lesbians. The second parallel uh, is that both gay and lesbian couples and religious dissenters seek to live their identities authentically, consistently in the institutions and settings of civil society. Gay and lesbian couples claim a right beyond private behavior in the bedroom, the right to participate in the social institution of civil marriage. Religious believers likewise claim a right to follow their faith, not just in worship services, but also in the charitable activity of their organizations, uh, religious organizations, and in their daily lives. And this point is central to the current disputes over the scope of religious objectors' rights. Everyone claims to believe in free exercise of religion. Everyone accepts, for example, grudgingly or not, that the house of worship uh, cannot be forced to perform a marriage. But the exemptions in the initial drafts of state marriage equality legislation often go no further than that, than the house of worship. And free exercise is marginalized if it doesn't extend further. If it doesn't extend at least to the charitable activities, social services, and schools, in which religious groups engage. The state should not tell them to keep their faith in the churches any more than it should tell same-sex couples to keep their relationships private. A final parallel between same-sex couples and religious dissenters is that what each experiences as among the highest virtues is condemned by others as a grave evil. The religious traditionalist side is prone to reduce same-sex relationships to the sexual conduct that it believes is disorder, and to ignore the loving commitments of mutual care and support in those relationships. But there's a countering tendency of gay rights supporters to reduce religious traditionalists to their views and actions on this issue, to reduce them to an image of bigots, and ignore the wide-ranging nature of their commitments, uh, which include things like serving others through their religious communities. Gays and lesbians and religious conservatives are each dismissed as evil by a substantial portion of the population, and therefore each is subject, when in the minority, to substantial risks of intolerant and unjustifiably burdensome regulation. Now, with some qualifications, I think most of these arguments apply to religious organizations as well as to individuals. Organizations have religious identities, reflecting a web of connections uh, and the exercise of that religion by uh, individuals associated with the institution, like decision makers, employees, donors, uh, and others. Indeed, in many cases, uh, including in the provision of charitable services to others, individuals find it very hard to act in the name of their faith, uh, except through institutions. Organizations also have an interest in authenticity and consistency in ensuring that their actions coincide with their religious identity. Now, we know, of course, that there are disagreements within the organizations. We see examples constantly, especially, but not only, when religious organizations employ people outside of the faith. 
meaningful religious liberty, in my view, includes at least some presumption that those disagreements will be resolved within the institution according to its own decision-making procedures without state imposition. Doesn't mean that they can't be regulated. We'll have to draw categories of where uh, regulation is uh, permissible. But if an organization su becomes subject to any and all regulation once it reaches out to non-adherence, it would be pushed back into the private insular sphere. The classic American solution to these problems, uh, kind of problems, is to protect the liberty of both sides from state impositions. Same-sex couples should not be denied the right to marriage, and the state should not force, force dissenting religious organizations to recognize or facilitate uh, marriages. Uh, the religious liberty rights should extend into civil society uh, to religious charitable organizations. I would also argue that it sh uh, should extend with limits to certain individuals in small commercial businesses. But if we can agree that religious freedom should extend beyond the churches at least, we can then talk about where to draw the line beyond that. That's the, uh, what I just laid out is a principled case, I think, or a principled case for accommodation of religious objections by courts or legislators. Um, there's a pragmatic case, too, uh, which pertains uh, specifically, inherently, to accommodations by legislatures that make pragmatic arguments to the legislature. Legislation to recognize same-sex marriage has uh, often received the crucial votes uh, because exemptions were added that meaningfully protected faith-based service organizations, not just clergy or churches. Uh, in three of the seven states that enacted marriage equality by 2012, uh, proposed legislation pr offering protection only to the clergy failed to garner enough support to become law. And then months later, in those three states, revised bills passed with more expansive protections. Uh, in New York, the New York Times concluded uh, religious exemptions were the most pivotal feature of the uh, successful bill. And they're likely to be important in the future uh, as well, uh, for reasons I can, I can go into. Now, a second uh, point to uh, raise uh, that I want to talk about is briefly what effect will uh, the Windsor decision have on these kinds of questions. Indeed, actually, more broadly, what effect does the recognition of same-sex marriage have on these questions? After all, as many have pointed out, these issues have been around for years uh, before same-sex marriage uh, and outside of the marriage context, in cases outside the marriage context. Um, so why, why bring them up now? Uh, well, recognition of same-sex marriage will increase the conflicts. It will simply create more, more cases. Um, it will remove defendants' arguments that they've made in some cases and won in some cases that they disfavor all non-marital intimate relations. With a uh, case with, with same-sex marriage recognized, they won't be able to make that argument anymore. The most important uh, uh, reason, though, I think why this needs to be attended to now is what I call the Bob Jones uh, effect. Uh, and that is the case, uh, refers to the Bob Jones University case, uh, which the court upheld the withdrawal of a tax exempt status from a uh, small fundamentalist college in uh, South Carolina that uh, forbade interracial dating. Uh, the court uh, said that in rejecting Bob Jones's free exercise argument, the court said. First, that withdrawal of a tax exemption is not that great a burden, uh, which is, I think, untrue. If you talk to any uh, one who runs an organization, uh, that they, they disagree strongly with that. Um, second, uh, though, racial discrimination is an overriding compelling interest. And the reason why it's an overriding compelling interest is that it's reflected over and uh, preventing racial discrimination uh, is an interest is, is that it's reflected over and over again in our laws. We have so many laws preventing racial discrimination. They have almost no exemptions. There is a societal judgment that this, uh, this uh, kind of discrimination is particularly, uh, particularly bad. Uh, I think that kind of effect can happen to religious organizations. The, the more that uh, 
that marriage is recognized without some recognition of the countervailing religious liberty interests. The same kind of conclusion may be reached by the courts, not just in marriage cases, but in all other uh, uh, cases. And with that, I'm going to have to stop. I'm getting a stop answer or a sign, and I'm going to be I saw what happened to Kenji, and I don't want that to happen to me. Uh, but I have a little bit more to say about what Windsor might mean, and I can talk about that, I guess, in the questions. Thank you. Uh, it's a great honor uh, to be part of this group, and I actually really appreciate Professor Berg's remarks. Uh, the one thing I didn't appreciate about Professor Carlin's uh, humorous introduction, uh, there was a little bit of misrepresentation involved there. I think we, Professor Berg did some great origami. Uh, Marianne Case did literal origami. And I'm just not very good at that. But I, I'm going to take up where Berg left off and talk about the interrelationship between religious liberty and marriage equality. And uh, I like, among other things, the fact that Professor Berg did not do this doomsday scenario. This is going to be a threat to religious liberty. Uh, in the gross. Uh, and here's my origami on that. It's not very good. You know, a lot of the opponents of marriage equality say, here are churches, and once we have marriage equality, it's going to be like this, and it's going to destroy religion. And I think it's not going to be like that. And here's I think it's going to be a more complicated church. OK, so I've disproved you. I'm bad at origami. Uh, but that's my point, uh, is that exactly as Professor Berg said, uh, with marriage equality, whether it's by legislation or by uh, constitutional adjudication at the state or the national level, uh, it is going to increase the range of conflicts. It's also going to produce um, more court decisions and probably more constitutional law, at least in the medium uh, and long term. Uh, uh, but in the longer term, I think the big punchline of marriage equality is it's going to change the nature of religious faith itself. So let me go through first the legal stuff, uh, trying not to repeat what Professor Berg said, but trying to augment it uh, in a very uh, friendly way. I want to talk about the effect on religious persons, uh, effect on core religious institutions, uh, and then religiously um, faith-based companies that are not uh, formal religious institutions. Uh, on the religious persons front, uh, if Windsor does uh, lead to the nationalization of marriage equality rights, uh, as it indeed might do, but it might not do, uh, as we've seen today. Uh, one effect of that will be uh, that uh, it will put state and local officials on the spot uh, in states where churches are most strongly opposed, especially but not limited to the Baptist uh, South. Uh, exactly as Professor Burke says, under Smith versus Employment Division and under the public employment cases like Connock, uh, governmental clerks probably have no First Amendment right to refuse uh, to do their jobs under a marriage equality regime. But, and here's an important but, but implementation of a Windsor non-discrimination regime would be fraught with practical problems in the South. Uh, and I also agree with Professor Berg, there might be some many DOMA lawsuits, uh, uh, not many DOMA, many RIFRA lawsuits in some of these states. Uh, and I think we would see in these states uh, some degree of resistance among the clerks and indeed, in the southern states, we will see efforts at legislative evasion through procedural roadblocks uh, implemented by these clerks, uh, such as, for example, uh, a counseling requirement for marriage licenses for everybody, but a counseling requirement that would be more difficult to achieve for uh, uh, same-sex couples in a religiously fundamental uh, area. In other words, exactly as we've seen in reproductive rights, if we win marriage equality at the national level, the shift will be away from demand-side strategies, once they've lost the right, to supply-side resistance. Okay, uh, And as we've seen in reproductive rights, supply-side resistance can often be more effective at thwarting rights than demand-side uh, persuasion. Uh, so that's for religious persons. Uh, and, and remember, most religious persons are OK with marriage equality. Uh, some religious persons who are just as sincere are not OK with it. What about religious or strongly religion-affiliated institutions? Uh, state marriage laws uh, generally exempt churches and other religious institutions from any requirement that they or their ministers or officials celebrate, participate in, uh, marriages inconsistent with their own religious doctrine. 
Supreme Court in Hosanna Tabor in 2012 suggests that these exemptions are probably required by the free exercise and establishment clauses of the First Amendment. At least uh, Roberts' opinion for a unanimous court, interestingly, recognizes a ministerial exception for compliance with the Americans with Disabilities Act by a church school. Uh, and uh, uh, the principle that Roberts announces in this unanimous decision is bottomed upon a constitutional principle of state non-interference with the internal affairs of religious institutions and churches. Now, the opinion is very elliptical as to exactly what this ministerial exemption is, what kind of institutions are covered by it. But there is some degree of plasticity uh, as to uh, how uh, religious institutions can denominate ministers. The woman who was called a minister was basically a teacher, but with some kind of ministerial trappings. Query. As an employer, can the religious school, say involved in the, uh, the Hosanna case, refuse also to give spousal benefits to a married lesbian janitor who's not called a minister, let's say? Or maybe they can call her a minister uh, after the Tabor decision. Uh, can the school fire a lesbian janitor as an employee because it's inconsistent with their religious mission? Uh, there's good reason to think that state law, if the state has an anti-discrimination law, can regulate this at least for religiously affiliated schools and other affiliated organizations. That Hosanna Tabor repeatedly limits the First Amendment protection to ministers who embody core religious mission, though Justice Alito would go further. Uh, the lead case is still Smith, which says that laws of general application can be applied to religious persons and religious practices. Uh, and then the Hastings case several years ago, uh, among other things, rejected uh, the Christian Legal Society's efforts to give First Amendment protection or claim First Amendment protection of status discrimination on the grounds that someone's status implied conduct and even religious beliefs inconsistent with the religious mission of the Christian Legal Society. Those claims were rejected by a majority of the court. Consider this also. Uh, say Virginia uh, requ is required to recognize marriage equality by a post-Windsor case under the U.S. Constitution. Do religious schools like Jerry Falwell's Liberty University then have to provide spousal benefits to married lesbian administrators, for example? Now, the answer to that is probably not, because Virginia has no workplace anti-discrimination law protecting against sexual orientation discrimination. That most of the conflicts that I'm talking about, Professor Berg is talking about, don't arise under the marriage statute, but arise under existing state anti-discrimination laws, and not all of them have anti-discrimination laws. And indeed, I would posit uh, that marriage equality at the national level by a Supreme Court decree will make it somewhat harder to adopt anti-discrimination laws at the state level in states like Virginia. And even just Specter is going to make it somewhat harder. Finally, what about faith-based companies and partnerships? Hobby Lobby, for example, is not a religious group. It's a closely held arts and crafts company owned by the Green family that views the company as faith-based and evangelical. Uh, the Greens recently won a RIFRA lawsuit in the Tenth Circuit exempting the company from compliance with the contraception provisions of Obamacare's health insurance regulations. <laughs> Does Hobby Lobby have to provide spousal benefits for married gay clerks under a state anti-discrimination law if there is one? Does it have a First Amendment defense? The, the Tenth Circuit said yes on Bonk. Uh, they not only read RIFRA that way, but they read the Free Exercise Clause that way. The Free Exercise Clause protects for-profit evangelical corporations. Uh, I think that's inconsistent with United States versus Lee, an actual Supreme Court case, uh, which held that Amish employers must pay Social Security taxes because they had entered into the commercial workplace. Uh, I think the Supreme Court could maybe construe Lee more narrowly under a different majority. So it is up for grabs, but that's what the Tenth Circuit has said, and that's what the Supreme Court has said in, in at least one case. We've also seen recently in the Elaine photography case just a few months ago in New Mexico, where their Supreme Court ruled that the state anti-discrimination law does constitutionally apply to this photography company as a public accommodation uh, and penalized it for refusing to provide services for a lesbian wedding. The court followed the Smith interpretation of the Free Exercise Clause and ruled inapplicable the New Mexico version of RIFRA. So uh, a Supreme Court national ruling that marriage equality would not 
have implications for faith-based companies in states without anti-discrimination laws protecting sexual or gender minorities uh, uh, is uh, uh, quite possible. Uh, and then it would have implications in states that do have anti-discrimination laws, uh, and which we're trying to grow. Now, that's just some of the lay of the land. Much more could be said, and I invited in the question and answer period. Here's my main punchline, though. My main punchline is that in the longer term, marriage equality is going to change the nature of religious faith itself. Public opinion, we know, is already trending towards marriage equality after Goodridge. Uh, and uh, uh, in my lifetime, and certainly in yours, uh, it is going to continue to change at the religion level and not just the public opinion level. Uh, as you well know, fundamentalist Protestants and many Catholic, traditional Catholic doctrine, view homosexual activities as serious sins. Uh, they mainly cite Leviticus, which is mainly about impurity rules regarding women, but it does have a couple of passages on men lying with men, and it also relies on the Christian tradition on Romans 1, 26, 27, where St. Paul, not Christ, but St. Paul condemns dishonorable passions among women as well as men. Uh, hence, those religions also disapprove of LGBT marriages, uh, which are not procreative and which engage in this sinful conduct. Uh, but in the 80s and 90s, those very religious beliefs have come under constant fire within religious traditions. Does the Pauline admonition in Romans apply to committed relationships? St. Paul doesn't say. There was no word for lesbian, except lesbos, I guess, back in St. Paul's time. Did Christ, after all, if you're a Christian, you're not a Pauline, you're a Christian, what did Jesus Christ, the kind of spearhead, uh, and after whom our religion is named, suggest church intolerance of sexual or gender minorities? Uh, I represented the DC couple in marriage case 1990, 1995, and one of the things that we did, we got 100 letters in 1993 from ministers and faith communities supporting marriage equality 20 years ago. Uh, since then, the Episcopalians have come out of the closet in support of marriage <laughs> equality and will celebrate gay weddings. You see a number of other churches debating the issue, and smaller churches uh, are also uh, going on here. Uh, and you're, going, you're seeing, uh, in both the recent cases and in the next round of cases, you're seeing a lot of faith-based brief, briefs supporting marriage equality from faith-based traditions. Other faiths will follow. Uh, what about LDS, Catholic Church, and the Southern Baptists? Probably not, anytime soon. Yet even these denominations are de-emphasizing, and this is a change in doctrine, de-emphasizing their opposition to uh, gay marriage and sexual uh, conduct among lesbian and gay people as central to the religions uh, of those faiths. They're de-emphasizing. So for example, in the LDS Church, their uh, enthusiastic public and financial support for Proposition 8, I assure you, has produced enormous dialogue within the LDS Church and normative changes within the LDS Church. Uh, just Google uh, the, um, what, what are the videos called? It's, it's not that bad videos. Better. Yeah, uh, and, and Brigham Young. One of the, Google that. And the best It Gets Better video is the Brigham Young video. That has changed in the last four years. The Baptists, the Baptists, the Southern Baptists, in the Baptist Standard, a standard Baptist journal, was raised uh, a couple of years ago. Churches were expelled from the Southern Baptist Convention for celebrating lesbian marriages. The Baptist Standard asked this question. Christ never condemned lesbian marriages, but he did condemn in Matthew 19.9, and you look it up, <laughs> he did condemn remarriage uh, uh, after you have abandoned your wife. And so I'm talking about males, of course, here, unless she committed fornication. That is condemned by the word of Christ, he said. How many of these Baptist churches that do not tolerate lesbian marriages are perfectly happy to have within their number adulterous couples condemned by Christ's words? And, and what the dialogue uh, might be within fundamentalist churches is, why are we making so central to our faith something that Christ never condemned uh, that is only indirectly condemned in the Bible when we are openly tolerant of relationships that are condemned repeatedly in the Bible and by Jesus Christ himself. Uh, and then Pope Francis I in the Roman Catholic tradition, uh, as you see, I, I don't believe has departed from Catholic doctrine. Catholic doctrine has always supported the non-discrimination norm. But this 
particular pope is now emphasizing the anti-discrimination idea ahead of the judgmental idea, which is more in the tradition of Christ himself and many of the church fathers in his particular church. Now, if you don't believe me, believe me, because there is a parallel for this. There is a parallel for this. When I was growing up in the South, how many Southerners do we have here? When I was growing up in the South, we are younger than I am. Uh, when I was growing up in the South, religions taught as the word of the Lord. Now, they had taught that slavery was required by the word of the Lord. They relied on Noah's curse. And then after slavery was ended, they were taught as the word of the Lord, segregation and anti-miscegenation, the Tower of Babel story and Isaac's blessing upon his son. And these and other biblical passages were seriously advanced as not only is it okay to be segregated, not only is it okay to be racist, but this is what God requires. You. And also St. Paul cited him for slavery and all the rest of it. We didn't find too many things that Christ said. Uh, and this was uh, Southern Baptists, Southern Presbyterians, which I was, Southern Methodists, not the Roman Catholic Church, at least it's not our official doctrine. Uh, in the 1960s, after Brown, after the Civil Rights Act of 1964, and importantly after the Voting Rights Act of 1965, religious faith literally changed in the South. And it changed immediately. Now, not as immediately as the Latter-day Saints. Remember, one day you went to bed with Latter-day Saints, African-Americans cannot be full citizens of our church. The next morning, the word of the Lord had changed because there was a new revelation from the Lord to the head of the Latter-day Saints. So it wasn't quite as dramatic and quick as that, a road to Damascus experience. Uh, but the Southern denominations, one by one, abandoned their racist doctrine. Even Bob Jones, uh, a few years ago, had on its website, not only did they abandon the interracial dating prohibition, they had on their website a, an apology for the racist positions they had taken in the name of the Lord, and the Lord no longer requires them to support racial segregation. The argument is that uh, the racial segregation and apartheid and miscegenation arguments were always based upon aggressive overreading of isolated biblical passages. They were always utterly ignoring the words of Jesus and emphasizing much too much the words of St. Paul. And they were always unbalanced from a Judaic or a Christian tradition by focusing on the inclusion, refusing to focus on the inclusionary features of Christianity and Judaism and focusing on the judgmental features. Final point uh, is to stop. Uh, and then the question that's like, Amen! I'll sing the lot! It's just serious. I was a sinner and a gassy Yale professor. The sister showed me. It's an evangelical experience at the Stanford Law School. Why are you? both for discussion among the panelists and with the audience. So I'll ask if people have um, comments or reactions they want to make uh, about each other um, before we open it up also to questions from the floor. Or whether you I have a question, Professor Berg. Um, Where did no. you get that handsome tie? <laughs> That's a great tie. OK. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my question is, Tom, I, I like the idea of mutual accommodation. I like the idea of mutual accommodation. But we're talking about the commercial marketplace, let's say. So we're not talking about churches. Uh, Catholic charities, you know, I don't know, they're going to fit in somewhere in the middle. But let's talk about Hobby Lobby, which is a faith-based company. It's privately held, so it's not publicly traded. Uh, and it's held by this, these, um, this family. Now, when uh, LGBT people go into business, we are required by law and uh, normally we do so enthusiastically, that if we have religious employees, whether they're Jewish employees who need an accommodation uh, on their Sabbath, or Catholic employees who need an accommodation on many of the saints' days, and I hope they celebrate St. Francis of Assisi. I don't know if they do. Uh, we, uh, as employers, uh, enthusiastically you know, accommodate those religious needs. Um, and we're not supposed to, and I hope we don't, 
fire people because we, we you know, if they're LDS, we're, we're so mad about Prop 8 that we take it out on LDS employees. Uh, I hope that doesn't happen. I haven't seen too many lawsuits where that's been brought against LGBT owners of businesses like the Greens, you know, LGBT families and whatnot who, who have their own little businesses. So we should be required to accommodate religion. And we should be told that, that even if it, it offends our own dignity and our own equality and our own public space, to have employees that we're paying and that we're supporting, but who are part of a church that has denigrated us, at least in that one campaign, and so on and so forth, um, I still think that we ought to be held accountable to all these various anti-discrimination laws, most of which, maybe all of them, uh, uh, include religion as something you can't discriminate based on. And so why, should, why isn't the, the mutual accommodation then Hobby Lobby has to do the same thing for us? Uh, that it can't fire the janitor who's a lesbian or the administrator uh, who has a same-sex marriage um, you know, for those reasons. And, and that would also mean they would have to pay spousal benefits. If they have a general employment policy of paying spousal benefits and the, the lesbian or gay couple is actually married uh, in the state, um, et cetera, et cetera. So why is that not enough, that understanding of mutuality? Uh, <clears throat> Um, I mean, I, that, it, it, it might be enough. Um, the, you know, I, 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 there, there are, there, I think there are various lines that have to be drawn in order to come to some kind of mutual accommodation. Um, I think the, 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 the main line that I think has to be gotten over that's been most at issue in the, in the actual legislation is whether we're going to extend beyond the churches and whether we're going to give something meaningful to nonprofit religious organizations or, or whether we're going to say, we're not going to give you that because you've reached out to, to uh, other employees or, or serving others. Uh, I, I, I think another line is, uh, but another line is, is the commercial businesses. I do think it, it, it should be less, uh, that the balance needs to be struck differently there. And, and the balance also needs to be struck differently according to whether you're uh, employing someone, simply employing someone, or in a more direct way um, facilitating a relationship in, in, in some direct way as with counseling or, or so on. I mean, these are, these are lines that aren't aren't perfect, but if we give up on trying to draw those lines, then we're going to end up not protecting uh, against discrimination, and we're also, and, or we're not going to uh, protect, uh, protect religious liberty. So as far as a commercial business employing, uh, can, can they say we're not going to employ gays and lesbians? I think the answer is pretty clearly no. Uh, at least something Hobby, 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 Hobby Lobby's, Hobby Lobby's size. Well, I don't think that that's the, the, that case is different, right? It's about it's about paying for a particular uh, procedure, which for them actually is an abortion, which is probably regarded in our conscience laws as the most serious imposition on conscience that that there that there uh, that there is. Um, so, but, but wouldn't paying for spousal benefits for a lesbian couple be just as Strong. It's, let's say they're Southern Baptists or very fundamentalists. Yeah, I think uh, I think that that's more targeted, and I think with with a religious nonprofit organization, that claim becomes becomes uh, strong to me. I mean, it's not strong. Is, it's not strong for Hobby Lobby. If, if I could oh, just jump gosh. in here, because I also would like to get um, Marianne's reaction to this a little bit, because of thinking about the nature of the corporation and whether it's a transubstantive nature. That is, in Citizens United, the Supreme Court treats corporations transubstantively from the ideological corporation whose, whose fundamental mission is to communicate a particular message to corporations that are publicly traded, publicly held, where you have all of the principal agent problems in them. And so I, I think one of the interesting questions is how that whole area of law is going to bleed into this. That is the question of what is the who decides what the mission of a corporation is. Is the mission of the corporation to make money for the shareholders, in which case you get a very different answer than if the question is the mission of the corporation is to spread a particular 
religious idea. So I wonder if you wanted to jump in on this. So I'm going to jump in partly on that and then take the floor that you've generously given me and, and pile on Tom. Um, so I will say there's, there is this move toward corporatism in the, in the Roberts Court. And the interesting exemption is the academy, right? Uh, if you look at Fisher, what used to be the corporate privileges of the academy have been radically cut back. There we're going to interfere, but in every other sphere, we're going to allow this entity structure to d decide things, whether it's the entity of the church or the entity of the business corporation. Um, and I, you know, I think unless federal RIFRA is amended, um, the corporation may have some, anyway. But so what I, what I want to say to Tom, not, I'm sorry, enough responsive to Pam, is there are many more uh, people than gay people uh, who are the center of Bill's question who care about gay rights and are opposed to the religious. I mean, we frame, we're framing this too narrowly as religious liberty versus gay rights, whereas, as Bill's talk uh, shows, religions used to object to segregation. They still object today to a host of other things. As a feminist, I'm very concerned about all the women's rights things they are concerned with. But to give uh, one of my favorite examples of this, Minnesota cab drivers uh, who are Somali Muslims objected to carrying passengers carrying alcohol, right? So I don't see as a matter of religious freedom doctrine how we can confine this to a debate between uh, religious on the one hand and gay people on the other without running into, among other things, establishment clause issues because other religions who object to other things um, will be left out if the accommodations are purely for religious objectors to gay issues. And as a matter of fundamental uh, fairness, secular objectors to uh, the religious, for example, to take a conscience objection, I, if I were an OBGYN, would not want to facilitate the reproduction of a quiverful family. A uh, what? Quiverful? What is that an adjective of quality? There's a line in the scripture about uh, children being like arrows in your quiver. Have you seen, you, you don't watch television, right? So 19, 19, kids, 19 kids and counting, maybe it's 21 kids and counting, right? There are these people who think that, that God requires of them that they have as many children as they possibly can. Um, and then bring them up very narrowly in uh, the kind of sex and gender roles that the Constitution repudiates. Um, and, you know, secular objections to employing those people, to facilitating their reproductions, are the mirror image of um, religious objections to facilitating the reproduction of gay people or feminists. And um, we're, we're we're focusing way too narrowly our discussion. If we think we can limit it there, uh, we're, we're deceiving ourselves. And there doesn't seem to me a way to stop short of Saudi Arabia, uh, for example, to accommodation to um, sex segregation, to, to take one example. I mean, I think, Tom, you were right, though, that one of the things, and, and this may also be Bill's point in a way, is as we have both a um, multiplication of religious views on a multiplicity of issues, all of this becomes much more uh, much more complicated. And I mean, if you want to look in a kind of transnational way, one of the things that I found really interesting the last time I was spending time in Israel is, of course, there you have uh, the complication that um, the intensity of religious preference among people who identify as religious has um, gone up dramatically over the last 20 years, say, um, in Israel, and it may be true also in the United States, that we get more and more minority religions. That is, it's much harder to accommodate when you have a much broader array of religions, or at least it raises a lot, a lot more complicated issues. And then the question is how that will play out uh, across a, a variety of, of, of different issues. Yeah, Kendra. Yeah. And, and off of that, I mean, I've been doing some um, diversity and inclusion work for corporations. And one of the things that's really interesting if you get inside these organizations is 
how religion is like the third rail. So this is, you know, like they won't, and it's interesting because religion is a federally protected category, but when you start talking about diversity and inclusion on the basis of religion, everybody's eyes glaze over and you're told not to talk about it, right? So, which is, you know, really requires an explanation is, and it's is, is kind of chilling and haunting actually in, in some ways. But, um, but I think that the explanation goes to both what Marianne and Pam, you were saying, which is a differential level of spread you know, of, uh, I think that you compare, Tom, a religion to sexual orientation. I would compare religion to disability, right, in, in, the, in the sense that corporations have the same problems accommodating religion as they do with disability because there's just such a wide variegation, whereas accommodating gay people and including gay people is much easier, right, because the, the kind of category uh, that you're trying to, uh, of behaviors that you're trying to accommodate, uh, at least from the corporation's view, is a lot more uh, narrow. So I fear that in this balance, the, uh, the balance that you're, you're trying to strike is, is going to be very hard to, to, to uh, maintain uh, simply because of this issue of spread, simply because one group is seen to be much more various than the other. And so if you're going to try and accommodate both of them, one group is just going to be perforce easier to accommodate than the other. Yeah, I mean, this is the, one of the interesting points about, um, you know, in thinking, as, as I've been thinking, in, particularly in recent um, weeks, about the relationship between the movement on gay rights issues and the movement on reproductive uh, autonomy issues is one of the things that I think has changed the two movements is because gay people are gay every day, uh, and once you come out, you're out, it's very different than what happens in the abortion rights movement, which is abortion is a thing that somebody does once or twice. It's not every day you are somebody who is having an abortion. And the result of that is gay people come out of the closet, they're out of the closet. Women went back into the closet on having abortions around the, at around the same point in history. I mean, that's why the two, I think, when you look at the two movements, the court's ability to empathize or the court's uh, knowledge of what's going on is so different. The, the upshot of that is that um, disability and religion are, in some sense, between those two. That is, every day there are practices you uh, engage in, if you're seriously religious, that interact with the world. Whereas for a lot of gay people, once you come out and the corporation you're at is giving you the benefits, you no longer have to have any relationship between your sexual orientation and the corporation. Right. Um, and, well, that, and, and that does really. Can you also say different. that's because formally and doctrinally it's sex yes. discrimination? All you have right. to do is consistently apply the existing prohibition on discrimination on the basis of sex, and you get um, all of yeah, and and, 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 and when I d law. did work on disability rights, that was that it was, I think, exactly the same kind of issue, which is there are daily accommodations that need to be made, and the, and they are very different for different people. And they have very different impacts on the people, uh, on the people. And I'll just make one last observation well, and then you, give you all a chance well, to speak and then take questions. But well, uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, I, I think for some of the reasons that Kenji said, both, both of you, Marianne and Kenji, Kenji said, uh, and Pam, the, uh, that religious accommodations are in many categories not going to be absolute. They're going to involve questions of reasonableness, like the ADA, which is. Uh, difficult statute to administer, but we do it, we, we get along. Um, and that the, the, uh, the, uh, the option of ignoring it, it seems to me, is more likely to produce conflict than, uh, than, uh, uh, than attempting to accommodate. That, I think, was the judgment of the framers. They certainly had a record of more severe religious conflict in their immediate past than, uh, than we've had. Uh, and their solution was not to uh, not to not to move religion to the private sphere and ignore it, but 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 rather to get government out of it. Not to uh, when I say private sphere, I mean religion in an insular sense. Um, they got they got government out of it, uh, and that for the most part has worked well in America. And um, I think, Bill, uh, you, you're right. That I think attitudes are going to change. Uh, throughout the country and in different religious denominations, they are less likely to change in many denominations if things are forced on churches by the government. I think the opposite is true from Bill's evidence, right? That if, if, if what had happened in the era of uh, black civil rights was that the churches and the religious believers had been accommodated, that's, I think, Bill's point about 
dynamic religious doctrine. If they are not accommodate, they accommodate. Um, if they are accommodated, and we see this in Israel with respect to sex segregation, they and, and in Minnesota with respect to alcohol, the initial response to the cab drivers of Minneapolis was, we're going to accommodate you. And then after 5,000 um, passengers were dumped, the state realized that it couldn't accommodate. This is, I, I'm making a defense for the lawyers in the room of Smith, of the notion that uh, generally ap neutral and generally applicable laws need to apply to the religious and to religions or there will be anarchy. This has been uh, the view of the Supreme Court since the polygamy cases. And it's Justice Scalia who gave us the rule in Smith. You defend Washington versus Davis, just a quick yes or no? Ah, yes. Let me give a, I I give a conceptual, let me give a conceptual framework for Tom. I don't want to answer your question because it's a good question. The Bob Jones thing would be, what is the interaction among law, religion, and social norms, or social norms in politics? Uh, Bob Jones did produce, a, so law produced a religious backlash that actually did contribute to the election of Ronald Reagan as president, which had a transformative effect on politics uh, and affected public social norms. Uh, there's another way that the, the dynamic works, though, and this is the way I think it's going to work uh, here. Uh, and that is that the law responds to a weakening of social norms, the anti-gay norms, uh, with some bold moves, including marriage equality. The marriage equality then feeds back into social norms, which then affect religion from the bottom up. And I think that's what we're seeing. Uh, I do think that Tom's caution is the caution that I've been sounding for five years. This is one of about 15 reasons why I suggested, I've uh, been suggesting for the last four or five years, that it was premature to expect the US Supreme Court in 2012 or 2013 to require marriage equality for all 50 states. Uh, uh, Ted Olson said, well, I think I can get Justice Kennedy, and I kept telling him, you do not have Justice Ginsburg. I don't believe you have Justice Breyer, uh, and you probably don't have Justice Kennedy either. Um, and that is, you know, Perry and Windsor, uh, and that was a smart move on the part of the court. These are smart people in the court. Academics often forget that. Windsor was a trial balloon. Perry was a punt. Uh, the trial balloon was a successful one. Social norms keep changing. Um, politics keeps changing. We're going to get more states in the next several years. Maybe public opinion, I think, according to Nate Silver, continues to go along our lines. Uh, and this produces a better atmosphere to do a possible 50-state solution. Now, will it happen in the next round of cases? I think it's quite possible. But your, your caution is, is a serious caution. Because at whatever point marriage equality does become all 50 states, there will be ripple effects, and not just for religion, but for lots of points of resistance. And I think one of those ripple effects will be that the religions will be forced to juridify things that they depended on the state for. So uh, you know, Protestants have been dependent on the state for marriage, and that's why they're so uh, obsessed with the same-sex marriage movement in the way that the Catholics are not. The Catholics lost uh, the state for marriage centuries ago when divorce, for example, was instituted. What's happening with marriage is what's happening with the public schools, which is that the Protestants used to own the thing, got used to owning it, and now have this sense of grievance when it's taken away. And my illustration is the Southern Baptists on sex equality, right? It was not until 1999 that the Southern Baptist Convention put in its doctrine and principles that it was a wife's duty graciously to submit to her husband's servant leadership. That's not because it took until 1999 for the Southern Baptists to think that's what wives ought to do. It was because before that, the state was doing it for them. But when the Ginsburg Revolution came in and said you cannot have female subordination, you cannot even have legally enforced role differentiation uh, embodied in secular law, then the Baptists had to juridify their own law. And if they're serious about continuing to oppose same-sex marriage, just like the Catholics who are serious about continuing to oppose divorce, and the Baptists who are serious about continuing to reinforce sex role differentiation, uh, then they can do it through their own religious uh, doctrines. I, I hope they don't. I hope they evolve dynamically uh, as Bill would like. But there is a solution other than uh, the accommodation of the civil law. 
Okay, so we're going to take some questions from the audience now. I guess, Gary, you're at the first mic, and so please come up to the mics because they're recording stuff. Yeah, I, wanna, I wanted to push forward uh, Marianne's thinking a moment ago when she said that the inevitable result of this would be that the U.S. looks like Saudi Arabia. And Pam, you picked that up, and, and you actually went further with it, and so would I. I. It, it would actually be worse than Saudi Arabia because in Saudi Arabia, they have to accommodate one set of social mores, which is Wahhabi oh. Islam. Okay, whereas here, if we allow people's religious principles in the normal stream of commerce, uh, allow them to withhold goods and services uh, because they are deemed to be facilitating behavior they find sinful or morally objectionable or whatever, then in fact we create a society in which the only person who freely moves through the society to conduct his or her business is one whose personal characteristics and personal behaviors are objectionable to no religion, um, which is difficult particularly for me, to imagine. Uh, so, 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 so there's a multiplicity of things going on here. The current version of the Employment Non-Discrimination Act, which is um, sitting um, motionless um, in, in, in Congress, uh, has an expansive religious exemption clause. Um, is Chick-fil-A um, are they being required to violate their religious principles if they're selling chicken? to a wedding or to maybe the baptism of a child of a gay couple or that, that we you know we already have the instances of pharmacists being uh, refusing to fill prescriptions uh, that facilitate behavior that they find morally objectionable. Can a pharmacist refuse to fill a prescription for an HIV drug because they believe that the behavior that led to the infection was morally objectionable, whether that be drug use or homosexual behavior, that once we get into this, this this, when we move beyond religious institutions and religious community-based organizations, and we get into the normal stream of commerce, and we're letting businesses pick and choose who they will and won't provide services to, based on the behaviors that they believe those services will be used to facilitate, then we have chaos. I think chaos is the right word. We have chaos. And the only result of that would have to be retreat into forms of segregated cantons, whether they be gay neighborhoods, Catholic neighborhoods, Baptist neighborhoods, because that's the only place where you could, and, and, which of course the society once had, because it's the only place where you can conduct commerce without fear that just simple day-to-day -day business will be brought to a halt because you hold a set of beliefs that are different from someone else's. It's not, you know, we think about abortion and we think about gay marriage, but it's not just those things. You know, I might belong to, or I, I don't, but I might belong to a religion that objects to overpopulation. And so when the, when the couple comes in with the 21st child, I say, get the hell out. I'm not giving you any, I'm not giving you Tylenol or whatever it is you need because you're just going to have another kid. And, and I, so, so this, this becomes the groundwork for chaos. And so I'm really concerned about this logic. And, and the reason I'm concerned about it is because this is the logic that's actually sitting in the legislative process right now. This is the direction in which we're moving. And Bill, I'm really cheered by your prediction that religions are moving, but I just don't actually believe it. And yes, Pope Francis said lots of nice things, and there's been very good reporting over the last three weeks that the Curia and, and the uh, bureaucracy in Rome have been really trying to clean up his messes and reel him back in. So don't, I don't believe for a second that there's going to be meaningful movement in the Catholic Church. And that's 17 years of Catholic school. <laughs> well, I think that disqualifies you, actually. I, I uh, was raised as a Presbyterian. So I, I, remember we were talking about the long term. Uh, the, on the racism, uh, this did not come overnight. You know, the, the religions were talking about it even before the 64 and 65 Acts. We're talking about the long term. And, and I will predict, so uh, uh, Gary and I will not be here 50 years from now. We will be six feet under, OK? Uh, but a lot of you will be here 50 years from now, and mark my words. Uh, by and large, lesbian unions, gay unions, raising children and whatnot, I think will not be an issue for the Catholic Church in the United States 50 years from now. I don't even think it will be an issue for the Baptist Church. Uh, the Catholics might never rescind various encyclicals that say this is a sin, etc., etc. but these will not be issues. They will move on to other issues. Uh, in these religions, and I think many of the religions will do so more, and I think we're actually seeing that already, the, the moving on part of it. Yeah. So Gary, uh, let me say, 
first of all, response to Bill, Catholics have always been in the forefront of support for same-sex marriage because, again, they don't depend on the state. Secondly, uh, what you say about chaos is exactly what the Supreme Court has been saying and what um, commentators on the court, like Eisberger and Sager, have been saying since Reynolds, right? That if we let religious exemptions as a matter of constitutional law happen, every religious person will be a sovereign unto himself and there will be no law. Um, and third, uh, what you describe with respect to the enclaves, again, is a reversion, if not to the Middle Ages, to the early modern period, to, uh, to, the, to, the, esta to the original establishment clause with the states being or to cuius regio aeus religio, uh, and again, is part of the throwback quality of what I see happening uh, in these debates. Gary, I mean, we've had a regime under the Religious Freedom Restoration Act at the federal level and in states in which that is true, with which people can, can raise uh, objections and put the government to the, the proof of its, of its claims of chaos, right? And when the small sect that uses uh, uh, Tea, a hallucinogenic tea at, it, at its worship services, uh, claim that the government government said this is going to lead to every other drug being protected, and the court said that's not that's not what these statutes that's not how these statutes tell you to analyze it. You can't just predict chaos based on on long claims. Right? You've got to show that that these other things are going to follow, but we have to have a record of them following, and um, so. It's not, I mean, just as a legal matter, it's not consistent with the approach of the, of the statute. Now, you might say the statute's a terrible uh, idea, R RIFRA is a terrible idea, but um, yeah. just, Chief Justice Roberts said this is, you are giving the classic response of bureaucrats throughout all time. I can't make an exception for you because then I'll have to make an exception for everyone. And that's, I, I, that's not an attitude that in general has been consistent with civil liberties. So my question is, it seems to me that the analogy to the civil rights movement is complicated in part by the fact that, you know, that was in many ways a religious movement, or at least a movement that was held together uh, and in many ways spearheaded by black churches and many of them in the South, and whose leader and figurehead was also a preacher. And it seems to me that that the same is not the case in the gay rights movement, which I think is much more secular. I mean, also happening at a time, um, you know, of really rapid secularization. I mean, you're talking about the churches that are more pro-gay. Uh, you know, a lot of the mainline Protestant churches are losing membership relatively quickly. Um, and you know, the same could be said of you know Reform Judaism as opposed to um, Orthodox. Um, and I'm wondering if if that dynamic sort of uh, plays into uh, churches, and particularly in the South, are, are going to uh, respond to the gay rights movement, and, and if that has any implications, both backlash and the legal strategy. I like that. I, I completely agree. The, yes, the civil rights movement, I did get the 1964 Act. Among the, the leaders were not just Reverend King and the uh, coalition of black preachers, but, but religious groups of all sorts. Roman Catholic Church, very big deal. Has French, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, although I would submit that it's not quite as different as you're suggesting, uh, I would submit from the very beginning of the, I'll call it the post-Denmark marriage equality movement. The big watershed is Denmark recognized uh, registered partnerships, civil unions in 1989, legislatively. That's what triggered the DC lawsuit and the Hawaii lawsuit, and then it's created this whole cascade. From the very beginning, religions have been involved on our side. Now, where your point also, uh, I think, has a lot of bite uh, is that religion changes not just in relationship to the rest of society and the law, but the rest of religion, right? So um, uh, in Bob, the Bob Jones litigation, actually, there were a lot of religious briefs in the Bob Jones litigation uh, arguing for accommodation of Bob Jones. Not to, but every one of the religious briefs, and I read them all in Bob Jones, the other denominations said, we reject Bob Jones's reading of scripture. This is you know, in about 1981, the Reagan era. We reject their reading of scripture. And so, and of course, they still lost the 501c3 issue as well. Uh, and I think that also affected Bob Jones, the discourse within, and Southern, Southern Methodists, Southern Presbyterians, it was not just you know, the Re Reformed Judaism and the Episcopalians, like two really good groups 
and race issues and sexuality issues and probably gender issues on the whole uh, as well. So I, I think that's a, a very good point. Uh, and yet on the other side is that attitudes about uh, uh, gay people, LGBT people, have changed much more rapidly than racial attitudes changed in the post-World War II era. This is an amazing uh, sort of change. So that kind of balances a little bit. The social attitudes have changed a lot more. Uh, the final datum I'll, I'll just give you is that Loving versus Virginia was decided in 1967. Uh, at that point, um, according to the Gallup polls, there were not many polls on these issues in those days, you know, 80 plus percent, close to 90 percent of the American people did not approve of different race marriages. Uh, they didn't ask, but certainly many of them, maybe most of them, for religious or discussed reasons, thinly disguised as religious reasons. Then every poll since 1967, 68, has seen more and more Americans accept the morality, legitimacy, goodness of different race marriage. And those polls have really, uh, the, the religious groups have followed almost lockstep uh, the polling on this issue. So I'm encouraged by the polling on the LGBT or you know, marriage equality issues as well. It's a great question. You should write some note or something on that. No, I'm not kidding. This would be a great note topic. Yeah, if I could just add two, th two, two points, one about the Windsor litigation and, and one about the, the attitude change and the velocity. The, in the Windsor litigation, we thought very hard at, at the amicus stage about how we wanted to handle uh, religious groups. And we went out of our way to do two things. One was to have a religion brief that was written entirely on behalf of mainstream uh, religious groups that were not identified uh, with the gay community. So we got the first brief ever filed actually in the Supreme Court by conservative Judaism movement. Um, and that took a lot of work to get those briefs in there. But part of it, it was to show to the Supreme Court that actually religion is strongly on both sides of the issue in the same way. And I think, you know, if I think about what the most important uh, amicus efforts were, it was the religious brief to get religions in there, the corporate brief to get corporations in there saying this is bad for business in a variety of ways, and the military briefs. Uh, because if you look at, you know, which groups do the Supreme Court think, care about the most, uh, the military briefs have been amazingly influential at the Supreme Court on the side of kind of social justice movements in recent years. So in Gruber, they talk about the military brief all the time uh, as, as an example of that. And we've done that in uh, other affirmative action cases and in, in Windsor as well. The other point I'll make just about the velocity of change and the like is, is a point uh, about empathy, which is, um, no conservative ever wakes up to find out that their child is black or their child is undocumented. And therefore, the change has to come from ex the exterior relation. Whereas an amazing number of people change their view about uh, same-sex marriage when they find out that their child is gay. And one of the things that we, we discovered um, about Prop 8 was uh, at the time of the fight against Prop 8, people thought that the most effective way to fight Prop 8 was to uh, portray to uh, the voters on the margin um, uh, same-sex couples and their children and say, look, this is important for the children to protect the kids uh, by protecting their parents' relationships. And it turned out that was not the most effective message. The most effective message was to have straight parents of gay children looking into the camera and saying, the only thing I live for is to see my son get married, and you should let him get married, because many more people could empathize with the idea, I'm straight, my child might be gay, than could empathize with the, the idea, I'm straight, tomorrow I may be gay. Um, and so, you know, I, no, I mean, I'm serious that, that, that actually those kinds of arguments make a huge difference, and getting religious groups to make those arguments is also hugely important. If you want to read the least read, most interesting document in Loving Against Virginia, Look at the amicus brief filed by the archbishops of the southern uh, United States talking about how they thought allowing Catholic churches to celebrate interracial marriages was a key First Amendment argument for why the statute in Loving Against Virginia was unconstitutional. It's a really amazing brief that uh, people don't look at much, but you can see exactly those same arguments being made today uh, by religious groups that um, believe in marriage equality. 
Just to piggyback off of that really quickly, uh, with respect to discrete and insular minorities versus anonymous and diffuse, diffuse minorities, uh, a colloquy that uh, Bruce Ackerman has been having with or had in 1985 with Justice Stone's famous footnote. I think like whether or not you think of anonymity and diffuseness as an advantage depends on when you pose the question. Yeah. So I think in 1985, anonymity and diffuseness of gay people cut against us. Yeah. But I think once you get to 2013, it's cut strongly for us because we're in every family and there's no gatekeeping mechanism that can keep us out. That's actually a good segue to my question. I wanted to bring your paper back in and it had to do with the temporal dimension of some of the uh, adjudicated and judicial fact finding. Mm -hmm. So uh, your presentation uh, reminded me of something that happened this week. Uh, Judge Posner has actually recanted on his decision in Crawford versus Marion County, which is the voter ID case. Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons he said that it was wrong, he said, but look, the plaintiffs really didn't present evidence that voter ID could be used as a tool of voter suppression. Mm -hmm. okay. And so, uh, and it was, so there's a factual problem there. That right. that somehow, I guess, but it was wrong, he said, the, the, the decision in light of what's happened afterwards. That's one example. The other is it's great. thinking Thanks. about the move from Bowers to Lawrence, and the, the for me, the most interesting sentence that Bowers was wrong when it was, it was wrong today and it was wrong when it was decided. Right. right? So thinking about the, the the basis of my question is sort of the stickiness of judicial findings of legislative facts, right? right. And how the timing of these, and this sort of was where I think you were just going, the timing of these decisions is so critical because uh, if Perry had been decided 15 years ago, right, it would be harder to dislodge maybe than, uh, you know, than, than if there were nothing, you know, that, that the movement towards same-sex marriage uh, equality would have been much more difficult if you had the precedent like that on the book. So I'll offer that at you. Yeah, that thanks so much, Nate, um, as usual. So, so helpful and thoughtful. Um, you know, I, I sort of think about the examples that you're giving as, as slightly different in the sense that I think of them as coming in, and, and help me if I'm missing a connection, under the star decisis factor. So if we look at the star decisis factors, like change in fact or perceived changes in constant facts, which I think is an important kind of riff off of the change facts doctrine uh, as articulated in um, Casey, um, is something that the court really looks at when it's thinking about um, stare decisis and whether or not to suspend um, the deference that it ordinarily accords to precedent. For me, my, my current project is less about that kind of stream of time and thinking about how facts are evaluated across the stream of time and more just the slice of time in which uh, we're looking at a particular case and thinking about where um, facts come into uh, the case, you know, for one particular case. And it goes back to, before I so rudely cut myself off, right, at the end of the presentation, <laughs> this is where um, I, um, <laughs> cut off. one, uh, my, uh, what I was really trying to, to articulate was there is a kind of compare to what question, even internal to the trajectory of a particular case of do you want the facts to come in at the uh, trial level, these legislative facts, or if they don't come in, how are they going to come in? And so the answer is they usually come in through amicus brief or through the judge's own research, which leads to a kind of Google prudence, right? Because the judges are, and, and Posner gets criticized for using Google and his overuse of Google and is completely unrepentant about it. Uh, and so the question is, would you rather have the facts enter in at that point, or would you have them come in, you know, at some point, you know, higher up in the hierarchy? And and so that was really um, the point that that I was I was trying to establish. But I think that one of the things that that's interesting about this Posner point is that he has a respect for the facts, right? So you know, <laughs> when somebody says you know facts are stupid things, right, you could also say facts are stubborn things, right? And so so I think that you know what Posner is saying is. You know, I'm an empiricist, I have a respect for the facts. And I think that that respect shows up both in this Indiana Harbor Belt case that I was mentioning, where he says legislative facts should be subjected to the ordinary adversarial processes, you know, but it also surfaces in this changed uh, vision of constant facts or a change in facts uh, under the, you know, what, what I assume is his interpretation of the four Casey factors uh, and reversing himself in this case. Did I, did I miss something? Yeah, no, I, no, I, I probably didn't ask you're right that, that given the examples that I mentioned, that there is, uh, it seems like I'm asking about star decisis. But take yourself out of this sure. for a second. Just think of a hypothetical case where you have a choice as a judge whether 
to spend a lot of time on legislative fact questions. And uh, you are sort of trying to, there is a lot of danger in settling the issue of legislative facts at a premature time. Right. Than if you, you know, try to predict down the road what, what so for example, right. they say it's right. Harriet's right. right? Mm -hmm. if, they, uh, if it had happened five years ago, mm -hmm. they settle that question, right? That's it. Leave aside, again, um, stare decisis, just mm -hmm. on when courts decide to take up that question or to decide it on more uh, traditional fact finding, you know, not, not legislative facts, but the facts, the, the other types of facts, adjudicative facts that uh -huh. we're talking about, right? right? That's a choice that judges are making at a particular time. And it, that choice makes a huge difference in terms of the trajectory of, of jurisprudence. Right. So, so yes, you're right. So thank you for that um, um, clarification. I did misunderstand your question. So um, on that point, you know, I think the place to look is uh, actually Judge Reinhardt's. So the opinion that would be most supportive is Judge Reinhardt's Ninth Circuit opinion, where um, Reinhardt says, you know, a lot of interesting stuff has gone on below, right? But the only facts that I need, you know, for the purposes of this decision are the adjudicative facts pertaining to whether or not there was animus, right? And so he does some things. He sort of tap dances around the legislative fact findings by saying uh, these are not issues of fact at all. These are foreclosed by issues of law. And I, I view that movement on his part where he rejects this notion of, oh, there have been no negative consequences to be found from lesbian and gay parenting, which is uh, Von Walker's decision below. He says, I don't need that fact to reach the decision. In fact, I'm going to eschew reliance on that fact because instead I'm going to do it on an issue of law. Right? So it's not adjudicative fact versus legislative fact. It's law versus fact. And he says, California has surrendered any argument about parenting by giving parents equal rights under the law. And so that's the movement that he's making. But I think that it fits very nicely within your framework, uh, because what you're saying is, you know, if timing is everything, would a judge who we, you know, is obviously sympathetic to gay rights, would that judge want to wait on weighing in on a legislative fact issue if he felt like the, you know, uh, that the evidence was shaky enough that he would, you know, be endangering, right, the credibility of the court uh, by weighing in on that issue. So I think that's exactly a kind of slam dunk analysis of what was happening in Reinhardt's opinion. Oh, such a great, great presentation and interesting conversation. So I was trying to think of some way to weave my comments about everybody's papers together, but I, I'll just tick them off instead. Um, so, I, and it's a couple of questions and comments. I'll try to be quick. Uh, but my first question is for Marianne, which is um, you uh, suggested that it was bad news for contract that the court is talking about state conferred dignity in connection with marriage. And I want to toss out an alternative read and get your reaction, which is perhaps it's a positive move because to the extent the court was embracing prior to, to Windsor, embraced marriage as a pre-constitutional fundamental right, that's pretty far away from contract. So the idea that we've now moved into a state conferral of dignity maybe paves the path toward state recognition that marriage is actually the state conferral of the bundle of rights and, and obligations associated with marriage. So if I could just tick them all off, it would probably be helpful. Um, a second is actually an observation related to Pam's point about the religious groups amicus briefs which is something that I felt like I learned over time soliciting amicus briefs from a range of groups. And it connects up to Bill's point, which is that asking these groups to file briefs requires them to engage in a sort of conversation that can wind up being transformative of their positions and communicative of their positions to, uh, to the members of the religious organizations in a way that ultimately may make more of a, it's, an, it's sort of an interaction of the law, social movement, religious communities that may bring about some of the kinds of change you were talking about. And then the, the uh, third point is about uh, just a, a, a historical note on, on some of the history around this thinking back uh, to the Romer litigation, and this maybe links up a little bit, Kenji, your paper and the religious focus papers. My fir the first deposition I ever took in my life uh, was not about a traffic accident, which might have been a lot easier, but was of Robert George uh, <laughs> in Romer, um, where he was the expert for the purposes of making a kind of natural law-based argument that the state had a legitimate or perhaps even compelling interest in blocking uh, anti-discrimination protections for gay people. And so my question, uh, 
so th th really that's just a little bit of a, a story. You know, this is not new. Even thinking about testimony on these issues is not brand new. Uh, but thinking to the kinds of cases that, that come up now, and I'll use an example that Robert George gave me in, in the deposition, up to the, and where my question is going to be, what do, what do all of you think about the utility of fact-finding in the uh, religious accommodation uh, claims as against uh, gay people's equality cases? And so Robert, Robbie George gave the example of a, um, that he thought it would be permissible for a landlord, and I'll posit this in my hypothetical, as a large landlord, so we don't get into small exemptions, so a large landlord covered by anti-discrimination law, he thought it would be permissible for a landlord to inquire uh, before renting to prospective tenants whether those tenants used barrier contraception, that that is you know, consistent with his religious views and that it could be offensive to the landlord to have to rent to people who use barrier contraception. And as I think about a case like that, um, I was trying to think about it through the lens of, of a trial because I do think that factual development is, can be quite, quite useful, but I'm, I'm wondering how useful it is in these kinds of cases where we're really uh, seeing a, a clash of rights claims. So who would like to take the part of the question that Suzanne addressed to them first? Because I'll give everybody a chance to weigh in, but I just want <coughs> So since I had a specific question directed to me, let me answer the specific question and the general question, and then the rest of the, I think, is um, So with respect to the specific question on, on um, contract, so this is complicated, and I haven't thought this through clearly in my own mind yet. But when I wrote about Lawrence, one of the things I said is that some people see it as um, the culmination of, of fundamental due process right to marry, and I see it as potentially the abolition, the removal of the last nail in the coffin from a fundamental due process right to marry, because um, the question is, what is the right to marry? Is it the right to get the license from the state, or is it to, the right to do all those things that you used to have to have a license from the state to do, or you would be sent to jail, like have sex, have kids? Um, cohabit and, and, and that sort of thing. And I think what we're seeing is um, if there is a right to marry, it's an equality right to marry uh, in the sense of getting a license from the state. That's the state conferring, right? And that's part of, you know, um, with respect to what you say about Robbie George. Um, <laughs> So one of my other papers I'm working on is a comparison of the French and the American same-sex marriage debates. And part of that, which I meant to say in my presentation and didn't, was that uh, the labels are wrong on both ends, right? We call it marriage equality, where it really uh, is what the French say they have, which is mariage pour tous, marriage for everyone. Uh, whereas they call it marriage for everyone, but they really mean let's open it up. One of the other interesting things about the difference in the debate, and this gets to the uh, concealed role of religion, and again, my hobby horse, the importance of the constitutional norm of sex discrimination in the United States, is if you look at what Robbie George says about sexual complementarity, uh, it is radically different from what Ratzinger says and what people in France who do not, because France is secularist, um, invoke religion, but instead invoke Lacan, get, get up in the 90s on the floor of the French Assembly and say the symbolic order would be destroyed by same-sex marriage, which is another way of saying what Ratzinger is saying, which is if you take males and females out of the law, humans will become psychotic, human nature will be destroyed. They talk about complementarity in a way that it is fundamentally unconstitutional for the law to do in the United States, and therefore, Robbie George, who is, in addition to being a good Catholic, an American lawyer, talks only about the one form of complementarity that is constitutionally permissible embodied in law, which is physical biological complementarity. Insert tab A into slot B, rather than a thick and rich notion of maleness and femaleness. So the, the factual debate, what, what counts as expertise and what those experts are saying is radically different in the US and um, France, even when we're talking about people coming from fundamentally the same perspective, fundamentally no pun intended. So Suzanne, Suzanne in answer to your to question, which partly directed to me, um, 
I think religious accommodation litigation is inevitably fact-based. Um, the kind of standards that are that are out there uh, ask for the evaluation of the strength of the government's interests as applied to this objector with uh, acknowledgement of the fact that there may be other claims coming down the road that have to be considered as well, but some evidence uh, presented on the number of those claims that are likely to come, the, 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 the likelihood. Um, the, the Yoder case with, uh, about the Amish and uh, sending their uh, children to high school was very much a fact-based case, right? It made, a, it made a record on both the effect of schooling on the Amish and on the Amish's success in uh, meeting the state's interests that lay behind uh, education. And, and, and the cases since then have been fact-based. In the Holaska T case, they made a factual record on the uh, you know the, the lack of likelihood that this would become uh, a drug that was uh, that was trafficked, and if you you know if if you if you if you ignore that, then it seems to me you're 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 not giving religious liberty much. Uh, the, the the those those facts have to be structured by your decision about what the legal standards are, and so there are questions of burdens of proof and burden of per, uh, persuasion, how high high it is, but you also make a I think you have to make some substantive judgments about what kind of facts matter um, and, and what, what kind of interests are, are compelling. In the, you know, in the case, cases about small business people uh, objecting to directly facilitating a, a marriage or something else, uh, uh, you know, the, most com the most compelling argument for the government regulating those is, is access. Uh, there are cases where act, where refusals would allow or would, would prevent gay couples and others from getting access to services. But there are also a lot of cases where it won't. Uh, and there's absolutely no showing that there will be any trouble finding access to services. Now, we could disagree about whether access is the only compelling interest, but those kinds of legal standards then structure the fact finding. And I think those cases have to inevitably uh, involved that. Can I just ask a, a, more a very quick follow up because Bill wants it and we have others. Okay, so just really quickly, I mean, I guess the kinds of cases I'm think, or the maybe to, to, to take your point, so thinking about Robbie George's example and the landlord, so the, quest, the factual question would be then how many other landlords are there who rent properties at similar price, price points? Or I think of something that happened to me actually at where I work. Um, where a uh, secretary refused to hand one of my papers over to a colleague that I'd asked her to hand over because she mistakenly thought that the paper advocated marriage equality and that was against her religious viewpoint. So the factual question there would be as long as there were other assistants who she could pass, you know, who, who I would be directed to pass that along to, that that would... I, I guess I, I want to understand in terms of really what we think about when we think about access, what we do. Are, are looking at, which is why I do think it is helpful to think through the factual lens and get a little bit granular about what exactly we mean when we're trying to do this accommodation. Yeah, in right. response to um, your question to me, I simply agree. Yes, I think a huge role of amicus briefs is to stimulate conversations, not only within denominations, but among denominations. I think that's great, and bring into the larger conversation about rights. Uh, I think we've forgotten in this entire panel, one of the most important thinkers here is actually Sandra Day O'Connor. Uh, the author of Turner versus Sethley, and she talks about a lot of the issues that you're asking about, Suzanne, uh, and commits the court theoretically to a uh, much different uh, kind of thing than Justice Kennedy's being characterized as. Turner, Missouri said, prisoners, including lifetime prisoners, cannot marry unless they have pregnant girlfriends uh, or they already have children with the woman they want to marry. Uh, the Supreme Court unanimously struck that down, an opinion by Justice O'Connor. Interestingly, Scalia did not cast a vote. He was present, but he didn't vote or he didn't dissent, etc. O'Connor therefore wrote for eight justices, where she characterizes marriage not as a pre-political right, or, or no, even as, as something that can be consummated, because some of these people were in prison for life. She totally looked at the contract natures of it and the rights and benefits. She says, you know, even if you're, you know, in prison for life, you know, it still has symbolic effect on you, she says. And you've got all these state benefits. 
So we don't lack for precedents that look at marriage in this modern way. I might also add that she also directly responds in her concurrence in Roberts and J.C.'s to your question about the landlord. It makes a big difference to Justice O'Connor, and I think this goes back to Gary's question, is the Supreme Court in these cases is structuring. They're contributing to the structuring of American public life. And what uh, she says in the Roberts and J.C.'s case, that's a Freedom of Association case involving this sexist uh, J.C.'s thing, she says there's a continuum of you know, private institutions like the family at one end, much protected spheres of freedom, that maybe churches would be close, maybe religiously affiliated Catholic charities be near that end. And then you've got the other end, you've got groups, institutions, and whatnot that are part of the market, the commercial sphere. And frankly, it does make a difference. If it's a large landlord, under O'Connor's analysis, the state is not going to accommodate that landlord very much and allow them to snoop into the private lives of some of their tenants if they're offering these apartments on the free market and there's some kind of anti-discrimination law in effect. It does make a difference if it's Mrs. Bryant in her own home, she's running out the basement and she doesn't want you know, contraceptions or abortions or whatnot in the basement to her house. And there the Supreme Court is gonna give a lot more leeway to the individual sphere of autonomy. And O'Connor said all of this back in the 1980s. Uh, these are all still good precedents in the case of Turner. It, not a precedent for her opinion, just her opinion. But I think these are also words of wisdom that help structure our understanding of these issues. Yeah, and one observation about your point about the groups and their discussion, and I made a version of this point last night as well, which is I think one of the most brilliant things that happened in the Perry litigation was the way that um, Judge Von Walker engaged in what I think of as the four-corner offense, which is slowing the case down dramatically. And the uh, point I made last night was the case would have been decided very differently five years earlier. This is a version of Nate's point as well. And the analog that comes to my mind, um, because it seems so relevant here, is I don't know how many of you have seen the episode of Eyes on the Prize called Bridge to Freedom. It's about the Selma to Montgomery March. And there's an interview in that uh, episode with James Bevel, who was one of the architects of the Selma to Montgomery March, who said, the point of the Selma to Montgomery March was it took time. There was going to be a week when people would be walking from Selma to Montgomery. And then he says, this is almost exactly his words, that would give time for us to go out and discuss in the nation what our claims were. And it would absorb a lot of energy. And that was the point of the march, was to slow down the process so people would have time in the country to discuss. And what Von Walker's fact-finding did was not, as, and, and Kenji's absolutely right about this, was not to change so much what either the Supreme Court or the Ninth Circuit thought about the findings of fact in the case, but to get that image out in the public that the proponents of Prop 8 had nobody who would come in and testify on their behalf, or nobody who would make arguments that would resonate in the public. And I think that process of slowing things down by Vaughn Walker was the pivotal decision uh, in Perry with respect to us getting from the Supreme Court any of what we wanted. And so that takes us back to the last point I'll make here, and then I'll turn it over to, to Judd. The last point I'll make here is, probably the biggest exchange in Perry at the Supreme Court was the one between uh, Ted Olson and uh, Justice Scalia about when did the ban on same-sex marriage become unconstitutional? Was it 1789? Was it 1868? You know, and the answer is maybe 2003, Justice Scalia, when you said that uh, Lawrence meant we were going to get same-sex marriage, but certainly not before the 1980s, I mean, the, 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 it, just as a predictive matter. So I want to make sure Judd gets a chance to say. So Judd, why don't you ask your question, and then everybody can get a chance to One give two or three on minutes. this last thing? OK. At the latest, Lawrence, but when the sex discrimination in the case is starting to decide, Frontiero is the point of <coughs> same-sex marriage. Um, or Craig. Frontiero, there was not a majority opinion. Yeah. There's not a majority opinion for strict scrutiny. Yeah, but that's there was a majority opinion for that. So, Judd, yeah. Judd, now that you've heard the one sentence which has lots of participial clauses and semicolons <laughs> in it, it's a Catholic school, what can I say? Yeah, so I found Bill's question to Tom really interesting, and I was wondering if I could just throw it back to Bill um, and maybe throw two concepts into the mix. 
uh, and those are germaneness and significant burden, uh, which are concepts that get used in this area of law. And the basic idea here would be something like um, the, re the reason that you would give more uh, broader respect to religious objection here is that, um, that the religious objection is actually germane to the religious belief. So the exemption is germane to the religious belief in a way that may not be true with respect to homosexuality. So it'd be something like we give uh, an exemption right to someone who says their religion prevents them from, uh, I don't know, photographing at a gay wedding um, because that's germane to their religious belief and because it imposes a significant burden on their religious belief. Whereas it, it's a little harder to imagine somebody saying um, having to work with someone who's uh, of a different religion as a gay person is a significant burden on my sexuality. That would just be the, the hypothesis. So anyway, that's not to, to present a strong form argument, but I was just wondering if you could answer your own question with that view in mind. Great. Um, well, here's, what, here's the stab at it, uh, is that it depends on your perception. Uh, you know, for the, uh, Suzanne's, uh, for the landlord who doesn't want contraception in one of her 4,000 apartments, uh, that is not violating the landlord's religious beliefs. Uh, uh, the landlord's objection is, is that she is providing a forum for someone else to violate those beliefs. Okay? Uh, so it's kind of a secondary objection. Uh, and it's a facilitation objection. I, but again, part of the answer to that is O'Connor's answer. That's the core answer, is that when you go into the marketplace, then the, uh, the uh, legislature and the court have structured the marketplace uh, to be this normative spot, et cetera, et cetera. And I could say you could make the same kind of thought experiment for gay people. Um, and you don't even have to go Scalia's thing that the homosexual walking down the street is carrying a homosexual agenda and trying to spread it to nation's youth. You don't even have to go that far to say that there's a homosexual agenda. Uh, and that is that if you have a, a, a gay, um, or let's say a, a pro-population control landlord who happens to be a lesbian, uh, and part of her religion, part of her whole normative commitment uh, is that we should just reproduce ourselves, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and if she rents out to this, whatever uh, Mary Ann's term is, who's going to have 21 children, so I don't want to facilitate irresponsible procreation you know, in my basement apartment, right? And that's, so it might be religious, but it might also be First Amendment expression, that this is, you know, I don't want my stuff to be used for their agenda. <laughs> so they, I think they are very similar. Uh, and so it's this balance, uh, and it is a continuum. So it's from, from purely private things, like it's my basement in the house I live in, I ought to have more autonomy to do with that what I want. To I'm a big corporation and have four thousand apartments, and you know I'm picky about whom I rent them to. And then I think it also goes to you know like how central is this to your personal like stuff, um, et cetera, et cetera. So that's the way I would answer it. I think it's not exactly the same, but I think they are very very similar. Particularly this mental process of uh, am I comfortable with facilitating? Imagined conduct. And by the way, it's usually imagined conduct. Like the lesbian couple might not be doing anything you would care about. Uh, and Thanks it's a lot. And indeed, the uh, Mormon couple might not be doing any kind of overpopulation that you might be worried about. A lot of this is projecting your own stereotypes you know, onto the religious minority or the sexual minority. Et cetera, et cetera. Well, I'd like to borrow from a um, uh, statement that's usually made in a religious context, but can be made in the context of this panel as well. In the religious context, the, the statement is the following. You can summarize all Jewish holidays in nine words. Uh, they tried to kill us. They didn't. Let's eat. Um, and I think maybe that's how we can summarize the end of the panel, which is, I tried to interrupt them. I did. Let's eat. Amen, sister. Amen. Praise to the sister.